Hey folks, how you doing? My name is Tim Black. Welcome to the Tim Black at Night Show. I have a gift in close in this show for you. It's going to be the gift of intelligent conversation about relevant issues. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a guest today I'm very happy to introduce to you. His name is Lewis Reed. He's the national organizer for Cut 50. Cut 50 is an organization uh, that focuses on the formerly incarcerated. Uh, it's a grassroots groups across the country. They work to build and support reform efforts in our criminal justice system. You know, this is an issue very close to my heart. It's something I want us all to engage in. Without further ado, my, ladies and gentlemen, Lewis Reed. Give it up for Lewis, y'all. Thanks, my brother. Appreciate you having me on. Man, I want to thank you for taking time out from your work to sit down and, t and talk and have this important conversation, my friend. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, this is not taking time out from my work. I think that this is actually an extension of my work. Uh, you know, oftentimes, you know, I, I've heard when I was far much uh, uh, younger uh, in my career that, you know, a job that you uh, you have passion about and by which, you know, you have just a, a love for, you never work a day. So this is an extension of my work. This is my work. This is the, the lifeblood uh, that I breathe. And I'm just happy to have this opportunity uh, to come on and talk about uh, criminal justice uh, reform. Man, fantastic, man. I, I appreciate that attitude, man. And, and luckily, as you, man, I feel the same way about what I do. I feel like I'm not really working, man, when I'm, I'm doing something that I really care about. And, and as, I looked, as I looked after having a conversation with Tesla Figaro, and she told me about you, brother, I was in, extremely impressed with your background, the extensiveness. I've seen your conversations with Jamal Bryant. Shout out to Jamal Bryant out there. Shout the out, Reverend. Shout out to Bryant, yeah. And... and Brother, uh, 15 years experience working in this advocacy. Could you mm -hmm. tell folks a little bit about your background and what brought you to fight for criminal justice reform? Sure. Uh, so, you know, first and foremost, uh, Teslin is, is super dope, right? Like she got that black girl magic. She's just like just one of those women by whom just exudes uh, just a level of intelligence, man. And I think that uh, particularly in our media platforms, you don't necessarily have that level of representation. So shout out to the sister uh, of Teslin. But yeah, when you talk about 15 years of, of being involved in this work, uh, my matriculation into this work uh, didn't come by way of uh, university. It didn't come by way of, you know, having access to privilege, opportunity, position, so on and so forth. Uh, in all actuality, it came by way of the federal prison uh, system. Uh, back in 2000, I was indicted for bank fraud and felon in possession of am ammunition because I had a moderate uh, uh uh, misdemeanor criminal history, uh, it actually enhanced the, the sentence that I was actually exposed to. And I was sentenced to 188 months in federal prison. Now, for your viewers and your listening audience, uh, you don't have to waste your time trying to calculate how much that is. That's approximately 16 years. And it was through the fire of that furnace of having been incarcerated, having been, uh, you know, around people who were excessively prosecuted, disproportionately sentenced, simply because they didn't have access to privilege, they didn't have access to resources, they didn't have access to, access to power, they didn't even have access to sound education so that they could make an intelligent sit a decision for themselves, uh, it lit a righteous indignation in me. And with that righteous indignation, I said to myself, when I am released from, you know, this six by nine cell, when I am released from this institution, uh, I'm going to do something about it. And I'm going to fight for the people whose voices are currently muted uh, through a, a, a prison term. Amazing. Amazing, brother. Um, this sounds like a, a very uh, hard route to go. It sounds like a... Uh, I mean, I just imagine being away from family and friends that long a period of time. Sixteen yeah. years is a long. You seem like, seem like such a young guy right now, man. I feel like <laughs> I feel like your uncle, you know. And, and for you to for you to say you spent that much time, man, and then I hear you talk, and my, my friend, you make me wish that I, I I went away somewhere and had an opportunity to come back as as articulate as you have. Well, you know, and I appreciate that. Uh, you know, my grandmother who passed away um, this this past uh, April, and and both my mother, they are my grandmother was and my mother um, has always been a proponent of education. And one of the great things that my grandmother used to tell me is that all of life is a classroom. 
and we are perpetual students of something or someone. So we should always be in a posture of learning. We should always be in a posture of, of absorbing. Uh, so, you know, what you hear from me is not necessarily something that I just discovered because I'm in this space. This is something by which, yes, I've, I've, I've demonstrated, you know, an aberration of judgment. I've demonstrated a deference of character in, in many things. But, you know, I was taught um, by two great women who actually really nurtured my precocious nature. <laughs> wow, wow. Well, I, you definitely do them proud today, my friend. Thank you. And, Thank you. and the work that you're doing. So right now, as we talked about off air, Lewis, mm -hmm. people are talking about criminal justice reform. Sometimes mm -hmm. they use it interchangeably with prison uh, yeah. reform, prison. Uh, yeah. And, and and it seems like so almost I'm afraid it's like a buzzword or it's a mm -hmm. buzz thing because it's hip right now. I mean, yeah. once once Kanye was talking about it and we got Meek Mill talking about it. Mm -hmm. Now Trump's moving on it. What what has been your experience? You got Michelle Alexander with the new Jim Crow. They, so oh, that oh, yeah. right, you know that that kind of like adds adds to the uh, to the mix as well. But see, so, when, yeah. when she, I'm sorry, but Lewis, but when she talked about it like a couple years ago, that's when mm -hmm. I became aware of it. Right. Correct. Uh, of, Correct. Of, of of course, I've known about it. I've got cousins. Mm -hmm. I, I got a cousin who did ten years. Um, mm -hmm. So of course, I'm aware of Chris, you know criminal justice and how unjust or unjust it is. But mm -hmm. when she spoke about it, it was just a level of, of detail, granular detail, that I said, you know, this is the real deal. It's just when Correct. I hear other people sometimes talk, I'm not so sure that they're educated like you may be about the system. What are your thoughts on that? Well, well, I, wor I work for Cut 50 and Cut 50, you know, as introduced, it's a you know national bipartisan uh, uh, organization who's who we have we have two primary objectives and goals. Uh, we want to be able to reduce the, you know, uh, national prison population in half. And we also want to be able to reduce crime in half within 10 years. Cut 50 is co-founded by CNN political commentator uh, Van Jones, who you may know another brother, black brother with the bald head, right? <laughs> <laughs> the only exception is that he wears glasses. <laughs> and uh, and also uh, uh, Jessica Jackson Sloan. And, you know, our mission, you know, in and of itself is to make sure that those people who are currently incarcerated, their voices you know, their voices are carried out into the community. We do that through policy. We do that do that through advocacy. We do that through lobbying. And we do it through amplifying the leadership of people such as myself. Now, to specifically address and answer your question, we have a bill right now that is currently uh, in, you know, the federal Congress, uh, if you will. And the name of that bill is called the First Step Act. And you very well may have seen, you know, it, it, you know, the hashtag trending on Twitter or on your other respective uh, social media platforms. You, you know, but President Trump, uh, he came out, you know, pro approximately two to three weeks ago, right? And he, you know, said that we need to have this bill passed. We need comprehensive, we need copious, we need smart criminal justice reform in the United States of America. So I'm not of the notion uh, about just because people do the right things for the wrong reasons, that they should be excluded from the conversation. I'm not of the notion that just because a person very well may be a celebrity, that that person can't use their privilege and they can't use their platform to be able to shine a light on this issue. I'm not of the notion that, you know, just because a person very well may not be indirectly or have a lived experience through prison that those people should be excluded from the conversation. I'm of the notion that if you want to get involved, if you have a platform, if you have a voice, if you have been affected by this issue, you should get involved. You should be involved. You should uh, be expressing your voice. You should be amplifying these issues and you should be standing side by side, arm by arm, arm arm in arm, you know, leg by leg, and we should be holding the line together. This is not a black issue. This is not a brown issue. This is not a white issue. This is an American issue. And and that's, you know, simply what where I stand and, you know, a lot of the a lot of my constituents and a lot of the uh you know the people that by whom you know I share this space with, that's just what our notion is. You know, I you know, I definitely I appreciate that, and I and I respect that standpoint. Uh, I, I I agree with you that if it doesn't much matter why someone feeds the homeless, man, I'm just happy that the homeless are being fed. And if if someone from Kanye's position or or Meek Mill, whoever it is, is doing the right thing, I want to applaud that and support their further education. Um, also, something you just you mentioned at the very end of your of your statement, you said um, it doesn't. It's not about race. It's about um, it's, it's not so much about race, but 
I, I think about Ben Jealous, you know, here in Maryland, he ran for governor, and he mm -hmm. said something one day that kind of lit me up, and let me throw it on you. He said, Community? And many of our white brothers and sisters have been stuck too. Look, we don't just have the most incarcerated black and brown people on the planet. We also have the most incarcerated white people. He said, Tim, you know, we, we have African Americans that are incarcerated at such a high level, but you also got to realize white Americans in America are incarcerated at a very high level too. Like the That's most right. incarcerated white people live in America. And I'm like, wow. Right. So, so I wonder if we can all kind of like bond together or, and, and kind of like battle this issue, uh, all mm -hmm. races, all people, you know? Yeah, and I, th I think that when you look at it, you know, oftentimes, you know, historically, and, and this is not to suggest that there's not a racial divide in, in, in America, and this is not to even, you know, imply or infer that uh, people have not exploited these racial uh, uh, divides, right, and these racial uh, chasms, and I'm not suggesting that at all. What I am suggesting is this. I think that this is an issue that has impacted people of all classes, of all spectrum, of all demographics, of all whatever fill in a blank that you want to add. This criminal justice issue, I mean, let's just pause for a second and let's let's talk about numbers because you introduced it. We have approximately 70 million people in the United States of America who are living with criminal convictions. Not 7 million, 70 million. Seven, so we are, are a minority of a majority. And you think that there are 70 million black folks who are living with criminal convictions? Absolutely not. You think that there's 70 million Hispanic folks that are living with criminal convictions? Absolutely not. There's 70 million Americans who are living with criminal conviction. And I think that, yes, you know, our community has been, you know, disproportionately impacted. Yes, our community has been decimated. Yes, our community has been bankrupted, specifically when you you know, if, if we follow the criminal justice thread, it goes all the way back to the Nixon administration. It has actually been exacerbated by the 1994 Clinton crime bill. And I think that when you look at who we are uh, uh, as a community, we have always been on the lower rung of betterment, you know, at, at every equation, whether that's health care, whether that's, you know, access to mental health, whether that is, you know, any other fill in the blank, we've always been at the, in, at the lower rung of that equation. However, opioid use has become to white America what crack cocaine was to us. And now that you have people of privilege who have to lock up their children. You have people of privilege who are being locked up themselves and they're being criminalized just because they have an addiction issue and they are applying criminal solutions to social ills. Now those people who are in positions of power, positions of privilege, positions of authority, now they're saying, hold, hold up, we need to step outside of our comfort zone, we need to step across the aisle and the left needs to work with the right, the right needs to work with the left, the black needs to work with the brown, the brown needs to work with the white and everybody in between so that we can make this uh, uh, issue and we can make our criminal justice system recalibrate it and in the spirit of what our founding fathers actually you know, foresaw uh, our, our criminal justice being. Equity, justice, and you know, in the, in the words of Dr. King, uh, you know, something that is going to be uh, uh, inclusive for all people, not the exclusive uh, for minority. Absolutely agree with you. You know, um, as they announced the, the First Step Act, mm -hmm. I was one of those people that reported on it, and I did so favorably. And I was, actually, I was optimistic. I was energized by it because I'm enthusiastically looking for support to, for criminal justice reform. Mm -hmm. But then I was cautioned you, Lewis, that maybe you don't know, get too excited, Tim Black, you know, because then they started naming some things about this particular sure. act that may gave may give me pause. Yeah. One of those being that we're talking about the federal prison system, not about mm -hmm. local state governments where most people are incarcerated. What's mm -hmm. your response to that, even though you support the act, obviously? Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. Uh, you, and, and, and I, I, you know, in full transparency, we support the act. Uh, when the act was first, you know, rolled out uh, and when it passed the House and, and back in May, um, I wasn't as much of a staunch, staunch supporter of the of the bill as I am now. Uh, it, without persuasion, without influence, I literally, you know, look through the bill line by line, precept by precept, 
you know, text by text, paragraph by paragraph. And I, you know, prosecuted and I interrogated what this bill actually, you know, encompassed. And I'm going to walk you through, you know, those things if you will allow me to. So on the prison reform side, uh, this is what is, you know, uh, referred to in the criminal justice community as back end reform. On the criminal justice, ref uh, on the prison reform side, first and foremost, this bill would be able to increase dignity and decency for women who are incarcerated, but just not women who are incarcerated, women who are pregnant and incarcerated. It would prohibit, prohibit the shackling of women who are pregnant and incarcerated. Uh, it would, you know, uh, uh, increase, well, it, it would uh, provide access, uh, feminine hygiene product uh, access without charge to women who have to, uh, who may not have the family resources, you know, to be able to subsidize, you know, something that is a very basic need specific to that gender. So we want to be able to increase, you know, decency and dignity for that particular population. I will say, you know, I was involved uh, in the state of Connecticut where I'm from. I was involved in a bill that was passed in the last legislative session. It's called the um, it was called the uh, uh, Decency and, and, and Dignity Act for women who are incarcerated. I can't tell you, Tim, how that increased my 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 literacy of my male privilege. Listening to testimonies, listening to very riveting and graphic testimonies. Topeka K. Sam, who is our dignity director, you know, she talks about, and it's hard for me to hear as a male because I can't necessarily relate, but she talks about how she had to quantify. She had to quantify her cycle while she was incarcerated. And when I sat down with her and I talked to her, talked to her about it, I was like, what do you mean by that? She said that she literally had to take her, you know, used uh, 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 sanitary napkins, bring them to the officer because she had an excessive flow due to a, you know, pre-existing uh, medical condition. She had to bring them to the officer. The officer had, had to count how many she used before he or she would actually issue her institution-based uh, 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 feminine hygiene products. I, I see you making a face like, like which, you know, that's, crazy. that's something that you can't even, you can't even fathom. You, you, I mean, you know, it breaks my heart. You know, I, it, it I, I can't even, Demo de de demoralizing it's in inhumane right. yeah yeah and, and i'm a male and i feel this way right. you know so imagine you know the women who are currently incarcerated uh right now that have to go through you know the same thing on a federal level uh you know the other thing that i, I think is very imperative and i think also think is very important is that uh the first step act would actually increase uh the the, the good time credit for people who are incarcerated as it stands right now the intent for Congress, for people who are incarcerated on a federal level, they were supposed to receive 54 days a year of good time. The BOP, by some sophisticated Einstein mathematical equ equation, they only give people who are incarcerated 47 days a year of good time. So we want to be able to increase that extra seven days. Uh, and I, you know, I always tell a story about how, you know, people say, well, you know, what's seven days when you are incarcerated, literally hour by hour, day by day, minute by minute, second by second means something. And when I was incarcerated, if I would have been afforded that extra seven day good time, it would have knocked off approximately seven months off my sentence. What does that mean? That means that I would have been home in time enough for my nephew who was killed to be able to grieve properly with my family and not necessarily within the sterile environment of of an institution. So I think that that's something, you know, that's a provision that, you know, I'm very, very, uh, very much a proponent of. Uh, and additionally, it would unlock education access to approximately 16,000 people who are currently waitlisted for basic literacy, Tim. Wow. Basic literacy, right? This is talking about GED testing. We're talking about vocational education uh, uh, access. We are talking about, you know, I mean, just basic literacy. Uh, so we want to be able to provide, you know, education opportunities for these people who are incarcerated. When I was incarcerated, I had the privilege of having my, you know, uh, uh, post-secondary education subsidized by the goodwill of friends, by family, and also scholarships. However, everybody doesn't necessarily have that benefit. 
they don't have that privilege. They don't have those resources for people, you know, to pull out, you know, a thousand dollars from under the mattress and say, hey, look, you know, I got you because I know that you want to do something for yourself. Uh, and, you know, it will also be able to allow the ability for people who, such as myself, I'm a licensed clinician in the state of Connecticut. So people who want volunteer opportunities to be able to go back into institutions, to be able to facilitate courses, to be able to curate uh, programs, so on and so forth, that would be able to unlock the opportunity for people like me to be able to go back and give back and let those people who are incarcerated know, hey, I haven't forgot about you and not leave it solely to the discretion of a warden as to whether or not he or she wants to have people with criminal histories coming back into the institution. Those are just a few of the highlights on the prison reform side. Well, you know, of course, what you and thank you for laying that out, folks. I hope that everyone who's watching has, you know, was able to take that in and take some notes. I know I did, and I was thinking, you know, I kind of get some of the some of the concerns now. But as you explain some of the advantages, it may not be everything that I'm looking for, but. But damn it, guys, it's it's more than what they have now. So Correct. so my thing is, we have a Republican president in office. We have a Republican Senate. We just got a Democratic Congress, a Democratic House of Representatives that hasn't mm -hmm. even been seated yet. That's not you know that's going to come in the new year. So why don't people want to just take what we can get now? Because these are human beings that we're talking about helping Here, who need our help now. Here's the deal, you know. People say that this bill doesn't go far enough. And I stand I stand along with that course. It doesn't go far enough. Uh, there are sentence to reforms in this bill that when the crack cocaine, uh, or it's called the Fair Sentencing Act, when that was introduced uh, and that was passed in 2010, it wasn't passed retroactively. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that you have people who are serving a disproportionate amount of time who are unable to benefit from law that Congress passed to say, hey, uh, you know, the crack cocaine disparity was dropped from 100 to 1 down to 18 to 1. And it was fair that it was unfair that they got locked out of that of that, you know, relief. And so on the sentencing reform side, we are seeking to have that change retroactive, which means that that would immediately impact approximately two to three thousand people. Um, I was remiss not to say that on the prison reform side with the earned good time credit from day zero, to approximately day uh, 120 or so, that would release about 3,500 3, people. So we're looking just with those two provision alone on the sentencing reform side with the retroactivity and also on the prison reform side with the uh, earned good time credit, that would release approximately 7,000 people. Also on the sentence and reform side, you have uh, what's called 924C uh, stacking. And in layman's terms, what that means is this. If you, Tim, if say for instance, if the police came to arrest you for, uh, you know, for a warrant, and when they came into your house, if they, say for instance, if they found some marijuana uh, on the table, if they found, you know, some heroin that you were using or something to that degree, if when they arrested you and your grandfather, if he had an inoperable gun that was above the mantle, this is a family heirloom, because you had drugs and you had a gun in the proximity of drugs and you are a convicted felon, that means that you could potentially be exposed to uh, a 20 year sentence because that, that the sentence that you receive for the drugs would run consecutive to the sentence that you will receive for the firearm. And that's just absolutely wrong. Uh, so that's another provision on the sentencing side by which we are trying to change. Also, you know, and I know that your 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 re your listeners and your viewers very well may not um, want to be bogged down in the in the uh, uh, the, the, the sentencing uh, uh, code minutia of it, but those are just an ex uh, certain examples of how unfair our, our 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 system is. So as it relates to the, the the people who said that this bill doesn't go far enough, I'm in the chorus of that. This bill doesn't go far enough. As far as I'm concerned, we need retroactivity for everything. 
We need to reduce crack cocaine disparity down from 18 to one to one to one. We need, you know, when you look at uh, uh, 851, uh, 841, and, and that's, a, that's a, a sentencing code. When you look at 924C stacking, as mentioned, when you look at safe, uh, expansion of the safety valve, when you look at, you know, the plurality of other things that are in the U.S. Uh, United States, United uh, States Sentencing Code, we need retroactivity for everything as far as I'm concerned. However, however, this is a first step. This is not the final step act. This is a first step act. And the first step to a long journey by which we are passionate about, passionate about, that we are poised and we are, you know, part of my language, damn sure uh, uh, adamant about making sure that our criminal justice system is recalibrated and that we have justice and not just us, but that we have justice and equity for each and every person who actually makes, you know, make it, it demonstrates that aberration of judgment has to stand in front uh, uh, of a judge and be, adju uh, and be adjudicated guilty for it. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, well said, Mr. Reed. Well said. The first step is a first step, not a last step. And there's many other steps we need to take. I'm just looking at the notes here, folks. Uh, this act began as a prison reform bill introduced by Representative Hakeem Jeffries and Doug Collins. It passed the House 360 to 59 back in May with support. Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Can you can you just repeat that for one second? How, how, what was the what was the what was the numbers by which it passed the House? 360 to 59. With support. 360, yeah. That means that 360 in support. This is bipartisan support. Absolutely. To 59. Yeah. That I'm was on the House side. Absolutely. Go ahead, yeah, I, just, I just wanted, I just wanted, to, I, just, I, I wanted to underscore that, right? Yeah, yeah. Because this is not a divisive issue. With all of the issues that we have in the United States of America that divides us, with all of the issues, you know, whether they're racial issues, whether they are financial issues, whether whatever the issues are, whether it's the issues with this current administration, et cetera. This is the one issue that we have in our political uh, uh, circus that is happening with our elected officials by which people are standing united on. I mean, we are standing united with, you know, organizations literally all across this nation, many of whom initially were, were opposed and many who strongly descended on this bill for, for good reason. Uh, you know, you have you you have the likes of the ACLU who came out and said, hey, listen, this bill doesn't go far enough and we're going to make sure that, you know, this is not the final step. However, however, what we have now and what this bill proposes to do is far much better than what currently exists, which is absolutely nothing. So I just want to allow you to, you know, continue to read uh, the merits of the bill. But I actually think that that was something to underscore. No, no, you're absolutely right. It is something to underscore. And I think one of the pushbacks from the bill is that, you know, with a lot of the disgust or anger towards President Trump. Correct. You know, that's and, and, and I, my audience is a little bit different. I want you to know that, you know, Lewis, my audience is a little bit more uh, open to uh, Donald Trump policies as long as the policies are good policies. I mean, I tell Correct. my people all the time it's policy over pe over party. Right. Mm -hmm. So That's if we right. focus on that and this is one of those policies, I think that people can gravitate to regardless to uh, what uh, what's their political affiliation. But I, I'd like to I don't know. And your work is I know you do a lot of traveling. You have you, you're an advocate. You go across the country. What's been your response? Why? Why does it seem that way? Why are people willing to talk about criminal justice reform? What's the what's the sweet the secret ingredient in this particular so conversation? So I think that there is no secret agreed in. I think that what happened is that sin is sin is indiscriminate. And when you have, you know, something that steps in, in, into your space and when you begin to be, you know, uh, uh, impacted or, you know, affected by something, it makes you look at things differently. When you have the propensity to be impacted or affected by something, it makes you look at things a little bit differently. Uh, I just want to pause for a commercial break there and get right back to the situation as it relates to Do Donald Trump. I am not a proponent of Donald Trump. Let me just let me just set the record straight, right? I have written in, you know, the Huffington Post uh, as a contributor. I, I've written several articles about the trouble of Trump's criminal justice policies uh, when he wasn't doing anything, you know, earlier on in his presidency. I, I've written about the story of OJ, race, 
uh, the Republican and and uh, uh, in the NFL where, he, you know, he talked about, you know, uh, the SOB, oh. Colin Kaepernick, you know, so on and so forth. Right. So I have written extensively about Donald Trump, as Van Jones says. We disagree with this administration on 99 percent of issues. However, when you have somebody that stands in that 1% minority and they do the right thing, irrespective to whatever their motive is, when they do the right thing on an issue by which you have been attempting to make get traction on, that you have been attempting to introduce, that you have been attempting to you know, bring people home to their family, when they get it right in that 1%, you have to acknowledge them. You have to acknowledge it. You have to acknowledge at the very least on this issue, I disagree with you with on everything else, but on this issue, I find common ground with you. Also, I'll point to history. I had a conversation with Isaiah Washington not too long ago. And within that conversation, he said something to me and it was almost like a Looney Tune cartoon where, where the light bulb dinged over my head. He said, it's interesting that on this issue, people can't dichotomize Donald Trump from the policy and him coming out to, to endorse it, so on and so, uh, to support and endorse the bill uh, publicly, so on and so forth. He said, however, LBJ was a racist mm. and the country knew that he was a racist and he had no compunction about being a racist. However, that didn't stop Martin Luther King from working with LBJ on the introduction of the Civil Rights Act. And so I say that to say, how soon do we forget? How so I'm 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 of the notion that better better the bigot that you do know, rather than the bigot who that that you don't know. And this is not to cast dispersions on on this administration. I think that we have a very strong ally inside in the form of Jared Kushner, whose father. Uh, uh, did federal prison time and he has been you know a, a staunch champion on this issue he has been at the forefront he has been the quiet uh, a storm in this issue uh he's worked hand in glove with our national director and co-founder jessica jackson sloan uh, well along aside with van jones etc on 99 percent of the policies from this administration i absolutely disagree with me personally not lewis reed lewis l reed as the national organizer for cut 50 uh not lewis l reed you know uh, traveling the country so on and so forth this is lewis reed as a person who was formerly incarcerated i disagree with 99 percent of the policy uh, of the policy uh, policies that come out of this administration but on this one percent i agree with them and i stand with them and i'm i'm, I'm grateful that we are finally doing something that is going to put potentially bring people home by no later than as, as soon as you know maybe the new year and as no later than in february of 2014. well I, I definitely respect your position on that i like you have been a uh, a, a person who pushed back on donald trump policies when i felt it was important like but there have been a couple policies that i have agreed with and and i have enough uh ethics and courage and more uh, conviction to say, you know, this I support. I support this bill, but I also supported him on TPP. But it's, mm -hmm. you're, you're right. There are very few things that I find that I can authentically support with Donald Trump. Um, right. Wow, brother. I, I think that, uh, oh, just I also want to note, uh, it's a small world because Isaiah Washington is someone that I confide in as well. And he's <laughs> we've had conversations, so shout out to AI, my yeah, brother, for, yeah, for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But look, I, look, I'm just, I have so much information in front of me. What are the next steps? What, what's the, I understand that this is coming up for a vote very soon. What do you know? It, so right as it stands right now, as you mentioned, you know, past 360 overwhelmingly with bipartisan support, 360 in the House. It's now currently on the Senate side. And we have, you know, uh, Cory Booker, who is, is, is in support of this. Everyone from Cory Booker to you know people that you wouldn't have even thought on it on the Republican side to Lindsey Graham, uh, you know to I, I mean the the who's who of of the Senate political establishment is in support of this bill, and the only person that is the obstructionist to this bill as it stands right now uh, are, are, are I shouldn't say the only person the only two people and one I don't even want to give uh, a platform. Uh, uh, two, but I would the other person I 
would like to uh, highlight because he is the gatekeeper of the sort uh, to have this bill come to the floor for a vote, and that's Mitch McConnell. So we are literally, you know, at the ninety. I was I was going to say the ninety seventh uh, yard line, but I, I don't I don't know football, so I think that we're at the third third yard line. <laughs> I, let me stick to an analogy that I know. We, we it's, it's 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 three seconds left on the clock. We're down two, and we got the ball. Right. So, you know, we and we're in a timeout We're we're in a timeout. We're discussing strategy. We're, we're, we're in our huddle and we're going to break from this huddle. And, you know, the only person that is standing in the way of us scoring this basket is Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader. Wow. Wow. Well, let's hope that Mitch McConnell uh, decides that he wants to be a hero in, instead of a villain in this particular case and does <laughs> right. what's right for the people. And, and, and as you pointed out so eloquently, uh, Lewis, that this is an opportunity, a bipartisan opportunity for us to unite around a common good. And it's more all of us are affected by this. Everyone I know, just somebody in their family that's been dealing with criminal justice in some way, whether they're incarcerated or they're on probation or if they're being fined to death, there's some way somehow attached someone in someone's family is attached to the system and it's just too much man well we're, we're, it, you go right ahead I, yeah i just want to say also uh, uh, say tim as well is is this oftentimes when you get bipartisan support on something it comes by way of a tragedy it comes by way of a 9-11 it comes by way of a katrina it comes by way of a Columbine. It comes by way of a Virginia Tech. It comes by way of a Sandy Hook. It comes by way of a tragedy. This is one of the few opportunities that we have in our political space, in, in, in our Congress, that we can come together in a tragedy. Notice that I didn't say that this is not a travesty, but a tragedy doesn't necessarily have to be the, the the impetus. A tragedy doesn't have to be the driving force. A tragedy doesn't have to be the fuel that is uh, 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 perpetuating this engine in order for us to be able to come together and say we have to do something about this issue. Yes, it's a, tra a travesty, but it's not a tragedy that can actually bring us together from the right to the left and the left to the right to meet right in the middle. Well, brother, I, I surely hope that that's the case, and I hope that the Senate goes the way of the House and we get this bill done. Thank you so much for your time, Lewis. Lewis, tell people where to go to find out more about Cut 50 and about your important work. Absolutely. So if you want to know more information about the First Step Act, you can go to the First Step Act. Act.org. Again, that's firststepact.org. You can go to firststepact.org and uh, log on and find more information about it. You can tweet, literally tweet to your senator. You can, we have a pre-made uh, letter uh, that you can fill out. It takes approximately 30 seconds. If my mama, if my mother can go on this website and 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 and, and navigate it, you know, uh, uh, appropriately, then anybody can do it. So uh, you can go on there. You can tweet to your to your senator. You can tweet to Mitch McConnell's office. You can you know send a letter uh, that we have uh, pre-made for you, so that you can let your elected officials know that you want this bill passed. Also, if you want to get in contact with me, I'm on Twitter at Lewis L. Reed. Lewis L. Reed, that's R-E-E-D. I'm also on Instagram at He Inspires the Number Four Real. And uh, shamefully, I'll say this, and I hope that my children aren't watching, but I'm, I'm even on I'm even on Snapchat, man. I'm about that Snapchat life, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, on, I'm on Snapchat at He Inspires for, for Real as well. Uh, and you can also find me on uh, on Facebook at Lewis, uh, Lewis L. Reed. Well, look, man, you heard it, guys. Uh, Lewis L. Reed on Instagram, uh, it, Facebook, Twitter, um, even Snapchat, man. Like that's and he is part for real. Yeah. Man, that's the only platform I'm not on, man, is Snapchat. I, I feel, I feel like I couldn't do it, bro. I, could, I just couldn't yeah. hang. Yeah, stay away from it if you got children. Because they, they... <laughs> I do, bro. <laughs> My kids tell me all the time, Dad, you got no business being on Snapchat. And I'm like, follow me, man. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, look, Lewis, thank you once again, man. It's been great having a conversation with you. And thank I'm going to keep following you to find out more about your work, man. Appreciate you, man. You got and it. I just followed you. I just followed you on Twitter. So uh, I want your, uh, your, your viewing audience to know if you don't follow me back, I'm going to troll you and we're going to have an issue. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. I'm a fo I think I followed you, but I'm definitely going to. And Thank I'm going to I'm going to tweet to you. So, guys, when y'all see the tweet, you know where he is exactly. Then there's no excuse not to follow you, him back. Bro. Appreciate you. <laughs> you got it, Lewis. Thank you, man.
Thanks. I appreciate it. I'm grateful of the opportunity. You got it. Well, guys, look, thank you so much, everybody who tuned into the show tonight. Once again, that is the first step act.org. They have it set up so you can just basically push a button and the letter will go out. OK, so so some some progress on this issue is better than no progress on this issue. All right. All right, guys. Thank you once again for tuning in. I'll see you soon. Don't forget Real Tim Black on Facebook and on Twitter. And I'm Tim Black at Night on Instagram. And I'll see you on the next one.